Hello, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to go through the BMAT 2016 Section 2 paper. This exam has 27 questions and has a duration of 30 minutes. This is the scientific knowledge and applications part of the BMAT. Just a quick reminder, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Also, leave a comment if you want further clarification on any explanations. Now, without further ado, let's start answering some of these questions. Question number one. The diagram shows a kidney and its associated vessels from a healthy individual. There's a diagram there and it has certain structures labelled. Which row correctly identifies the vessels along with the concentration of urea they contain? So step number one for this question would be to identify one, two, three, four, and five. They are all vessels, but not necessarily blood vessels. So now I'm going to tell you what one, two, three, four, and five is. So number one is the vena cava. Number two is the aorta. Number three is the renal vein. Number four is the renal artery. And, the, and number five is the ureter. Realistically speaking, you can't really work this out in an exam. It doesn't tell you that one of them is the ureter, things like that. If you know it, you know it. If you don't, you don't. So now that you now know what 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 is, let's figure out where the highest concentration of urea is going to be and the lowest concentration of urea. So using your... GCSE and A-level knowledge of biology, you know that the kidney's main function is to remove urea from the blood. So, the renal vein will have the lowest concentration of urea in this diagram. So, anything with number three is correct. So we've eliminated the others now. That leaves C and D. Now we need to work out where the highest concentration of urea will be. Filtered urea goes into urine. A lot of people know that. Urine, ureum, a lot of people know. And how does, how does the urea go into the urine, it goes through the ureter, and the ureter therefore contains the highest concentration of urea. So therefore, D is your answer. And that is question number one completed. Question number two. Element X has the electronic structure 283. Which of the following statements about this element are correct? The, elements, the element is in group 12, period 3 of the periodic table. The element reacts with oxygen to form a compound with the formula X2O3. Statement number 3. The element reacts with bromine to form a compound with the formula XBr3. Statement number four, the atomic number of the element is 13. Statement number five, the element is an alkali metal. So, immediately you should be thinking that number four is correct. This is because two plus 8, plus 3 is equal to 13. And also, you should be thinking immediately that this element is not an alkali metal. An alkali metal is a metal that belongs to group 1 of the periodic table. And group 1 metals have one electron in its outer shell, whereas this one has three. So we could do some preliminary eliminations 
using this information. So E is wrong, C is wrong, A is wrong, number four, B. And that leaves us with D and F. So eliminations is a very good way how to optimize your time during the BMAT to get the right answer quickly. So continuing with the statements now. So statement number one, the element is in group 12, period three of the periodic table. This is incorrect. Elements in group 12 all have valence elect two valence electrons while element X has three. That's wrong. Anyways, we knew that was wrong because we only have D and F left, but might as well go through everything. Statement number two, the element reacts with oxygen to form a compound with the formula X2O3. Uh, this is correct. Element X is in group 13 as it has three valence electrons. Oxygen forms oxides with this group metal containing three oxygen atoms and two metal atoms per molecule. Let's give that a fat tick. <laughs> And what do you know? We already got our answer of F. But anyways, we'll keep on going. Number three, the element reacts with bromine to form a compound XBr3. This is correct. Bromine has seven valence electrons, therefore requires one valence electron to obtain a complete outer shell. So element X has three valence electrons that can be donated during ionic bonding. So to form a stable compound, element X donates one electron to each of the three uh, bromine atoms that forms XBr3. And that is question number two completed in depth. Question number three. A student carries out an experiment to determine the density of the material from which two identical solid objects are made. She uses a balance and a measuring cylinder containing a fixed volume of liquid. The diagram shows different stages of her experiment, with some of the readings on the balance and some of the, uh, some of the measuring cylinder. Which calculation should be used to determine the density of the material from which the objects are made? So, Immediately, you should be thinking of the formula of density. Density is equal to mass over volume. So, with that in mind, let's first work out what the mass of one of these shapes are, one of these objects. We know that without the object in the water, the balance weighs 170 grams. and with the object in there, the balance weighs 470 grams. So if we calculate the difference, we'll know what the mass of the object is. So let's do that. So 470 minus 170 is equal to 300. So we know our numerator is equal to 300, the mass part of our density equation. Now, we need to calculate what the volume is. So with no objects in the water, the volume in the measuring cylinder is 250 centimeters cubed. And with two objects at, and the water in the measuring cylinder, the volume is 350 centimeters cubed. So let's calculate what the difference of that is. 350 minus 250 is equal to 100. So that is the volume of two of these objects. Now let's calculate what the volume is for one of these objects. And they're both identical, so we could just divide it by two. 100 divided by 2 is equal to 50. So we now have our volume portion, the denominator of 
our density equation. And what do you know? We have our answer. And our answer is D. And that is question number three completed. Question number four. A straight line passes through the points P and Q, and the coordinates are stated. Which of the following is an equation of a straight line which is parallel to PQ? Two things you should be thinking of immediately was the equation of a straight line y equals mx plus c. And you should also be thinking about what the word parallel means in relation and its relation to y equals mx plus c. If, the, if this line, this equation of the line that we're working out is parallel to the line pq, therefore the gradient, or m, has to be the same in line pq and this new line that I'm trying to work out what the equation is. So, step number one will be to work out the gradient of PQ. And how do we work out the gradient of PQ? We use the formula y minus y1 over x minus x1. So, 9 minus 3. So that's our difference in the y coordinates over our difference of the x coordinates. It's going to be 6 plus 3 is equal to 2 thirds. I've simplified it down. I assume that you will be able to do this. So now that we have our gradient, we know that our line, since it's parallel to P, PQ, is going to be Y equals 2 thirds X plus C. And let's find an equation that fits this model. Can't be F, can't be E, can't be D, can't be C, can't be B. The answer is A. That is question number four completed. Question number five. The diagram shows some of the stages of how a length of DNA can be removed from one organism and introduced into another. And there's a diagram of it. Which row is correct? So this question is asking us to look at this diagram and identify what W, X, Y and Z are. So, W is a chromosome. So let's eliminate everything that isn't a chromosome. Should be able to recognize what a chromosome looks like and it can't be a gene because the gene is the little black part that's being cut out by X. So, now let's determine what X is. X can either be a restriction enzyme or a ligase. And I will say that it is a restriction enzyme. So we can eliminate C. Restriction enzymes cut out particular genes from a length of DNA, whether that's in a chromosome, etc. And you could already tell that Y is also a restriction enzyme because that's the only option available. But let me explain to you why Y is a restriction enzyme. In order to be able to insert the gene from the chromosome into the plasmid, you need to have the same cutout, in a sense. If you have a different cutout shape, the gene won't be able to fit in. So therefore, it's very important to use the same restriction enzyme on the chromosome 
and on the plasmid. And now finally, we move on to Z. And Z is a ligase. It's an restriction enzyme. We're not cutting over here. It's already been cut. The plasmid's already been cut by the restriction enzyme. What we want to do is join the cutout gene from W and insert it into Z. And how is it kept together? How the DNA uh, phosphodiester bonds connected together? They're connected together with the enzyme ligase. And therefore, the correct answer is B. And that is question number five completed. Question number six. Which one of the following mixtures could not be separated using the technique given? So, A, calcium carbonate and water is a mixture and the separating technique is evaporation. Calcium carbonate and water can be separated using evaporation. The water will evaporate and the calcium carbonate will be left on the evaporating surface, whether that's a dish of sorts or a flask. Therefore, A is incorrect. B. The mixture is pentane and octane, and the separating technique is fractional distillation. Straight away, you should be thinking, yep, they can be separated through fractional distillation. That is the industry standard in separating hydrocarbons and the reason why they can be separated is because they have different chain lengths and therefore they have different boiling points. So B is incorrect. C, the mixture is silicon dioxide and water and the separating technique is filtration. Using your GCSE chemistry knowledge, you should know that silicon dioxide is like sand and it doesn't react with water. So when you filter a mixture of silicon dioxide and water using filter paper, the water passes through, but the silicon dioxide remains on the filtering paper. So C is incorrect. D, sodium chloride and water is the mixture, and the separating technique is distillation. Sodium chloride and water can be separated by distillation because the water boils off as steam, leaving the sodium chloride in the distillation flask and the water is cooled and run off into a separate beaker or flask. So therefore, D is incorrect. That leaves us with E. E is the right answer, but I'll go through why ethanol and water cannot be separated. So the mixture is ethanol and water. And the separating technique is a separating funnel. This cannot be done by um, by using a separating funnel. Question number seven: Nickel has an atomic number of twenty-eight. The mass number of four of its isotopes are fifty-eight, sixty, sixty-one, and sixty-two. Below are three statements about these isotopes of nickel. One, all of them have same chemical properties. Two, all of them have nuclei containing 28 protons. Three, one of them has a nucleus that contains 62 neutrons. Which of these statements is or are correct? So, statement number one, all of them have the same chemical properties. That is true. This is because they... All of the isotopes have the same number of electrons and protons. And uh, chemical reactivity is to do with more to do with electrons than it is to do with neutrons. So statement number one is correct. Statement number two, all of them have nuclei containing 28 protons. That is true. The atomic number of nickel is 28. And all isotopes of nickel should contain 28 protons. The atomic number refers to the number of electrons and protons that that element has for its atoms. Let's give that a fat tick. Now, statement number three. One of them has a nucleus that contains 62 neutrons. 
This statement is incorrect. The mass number of an atom is determined by the total number of protons and neutrons it contains. In the case of nickel and the mass numbers of 58, 60, 61, and 62, the maximum numbers number of neutrons that any of those isotopes could have is 34 neutrons. It's definitely not 62 neutrons, so that is incorrect. So therefore, the correct answer is D. That's question number seven completed. Question number eight. The mean mass of a group of N people is 75 kg. Jim, Karen, and Leroy joined this group. Without anyone leaving, the new mean mass is 78 kg. The mean mass of Jim, Karen, and Leroy is 90 kg. What is the value of N? So immediately you should be writing the three equations that can be written from this question, these statements that the question gave. So the total mass of the group over the number of people in the group is equal to 75. Now, Jim plus Karen plus Leroy plus the original total mass over original number of people plus 3 is equal to 78. And the third statement is Jim, Karen, and Leroy's average weight. So J plus K plus L all over 3 is equal to 90 kg. So, what am I going to do? What I'm going to try and do is rearrange these equations, well, in particular equation over here and over here, so that I could isolate N. So let's get down to that. Immediately, I could try and input this equation, J plus K plus L over 3 is equal to 90 into the second equation. And how I'm going to do this is by getting J plus K plus L is equal to 90 times 3 is equal to 270. So, this bit over here is the same as this bit over here. So, I'm going to just simply substitute J plus K plus L in the second equation with 270. So, let's do that. Oops. find some extra room. 270 plus T over N plus 3 is equal to 78. Now, what was our first equation? T over N is equal to 75. Now, let's tr rearrange this statement so that T is the subject. We could have T is equal to 75N. And what do you know? That is a possibility. And I'm going to substitute that into this equation over here. We to do 270 plus 75N over N plus 3 is equal to 78. Sorry about my messy working out. There wasn't exactly a lot of room, but hopefully you can follow the gist. And now this is essentially a simple solving of an equation so that you get N at the end. So let's do exactly that. 
the beauty of zooming in. You could create so much room. So I'm going to multiply both sides by n plus 3, so 270 plus 75 n is equal to 78 n plus, time to do some quick maths. Ooh. Two, three, four. So with that in mind, let's try and get the ends on one side and the integers on the other side. I'm going to continue this on the right hand side. So 270 minus 234 is equal to 36 and 78n minus 75n is equal to 3n. So I'm going to write that down here. The answers is going to be 36 is equal to 3n, therefore n is equal to 12. And there we have it, our answer, n is equal to 12, therefore b is the answer. That's question number 8 completed. Question number 9. The following statements are features of an enzyme from a healthy human. It works at an optimum pH below 4. It digests a substrate into amino acids. It works at an optimum temperature of approximately 37 degrees Celsius. Which enzyme has these features? So immediately looking at statement number two, it digests a substrate into amino acids. You should be thinking of protease. Lipases can't do that. They're for fats. Amylase is for carbs, starches. So you can eliminate A, B, C, and D. That leaves E and F. Now let's look at statement number one. It works at an optimum pH below 4. That is an acidic environment. Acidic environments are in the stomach. The small intestine is more basic alkali than it is acidic. Therefore, we can eliminate E, and the answer is F. That is question number 9 completed. Question number 10. More salt is a common laboratory reagent. Use the information of the most abundant isotopes below to calculate the formula mass, MR, of the hydrated salt. Formula of more salt is, as stated, the most abundant isotopes have been kindly provided to us. So, how to work out this question? This question is simple chemistry maths. You just add all the atomic weights together. I'm not going to tell you how to add them up, that's up to you. Me personally, I'll add them up in small groups and add the groups together up to get the total. But anyhow, I'm just going to write the overall equation that I would use. So, there are 20 hydrogen atoms, there are two nitrogen atoms, just tidy that up a bit for you, there are 14 oxygen atoms, there are two sulfur atoms, and there is one iron atom, and you add them all together and you get 3, 9, 2. That's your MR. The answer is F. That's question number 10 completed. Question number 11. An AC voltage is induced in a coil of wire when it is rotated in a magnetic field. This voltage can be displayed on the screen of an instrument called an oscill oscilloscope, which shows the variation of the induced voltage on the y axis plotted against time on the x axis. The oscilloscope trace below is a result of rotating a coil at a constant speed in a uniform magnetic field. Which one of the following traces would result from rotating the coil at a faster constant speed whilst keeping other conditions unchanged? So immediately you should be thinking and looking at faster constant speed 
and a faster constant a faster constant speed will result in both the amplitude and the frequency to increase and let's have a look at the options so it's definitely not d fair enough the amplitude has increased but the frequency has decreased e the amplitude has increased but the frequency is still the same a no because the amplitude is the same as the trace but it's, it's at a higher frequency it's not meeting both requirement points can't be c either because the amplitude is the same but the frequency is decreased and the correct answer is b this is because the amplitude has increased but also the frequency has increased and that is question number 11 completed question number 12 the diagram represents the circular cross section of an artery with an external diameter of d of 1.6 centimeter the thickness t of the artery is one millimeter what is the what's the internal cross-sectional area of the artery the shaded in the diagram this is a maths question with a tad bit of problem solving but not that much so step number one is convert d into millimeters 1.6 centimeters is equal to 16 millimeters step number two is to work out the diameter of this shaded area that new diameter is going to be 16 millimeters minus one millimeter minus one millimeter is equal to 14 millimeters from that diameter we can work out the radius is seven because the diameter is half of the radius is half of the diameter and now using this information we could use the area of a circle to work out the cross-sectional area of an artery of this artery so pi times r squared which is seven is equal to 40 pi pi therefore the answer is d that's question number 12 completed question number 13 which of the following molecules are involved in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration in a healthy human number one co2 number two glucose number three lactic acid so straight away you know that glucose is correct because in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration glucose is needed as a reactant now let's look at number one carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is produced in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration but it's not used it's produced so therefore one is incorrect and number three lactic acid lactic acid is only produced in anaerobic respiration it's not produced in aerobic respiration so therefore lactic acid is incorrect therefore number two is only correct and the answer is b question number 14 identify the correct products of electrolysis of the following electrolytes and you have aqueous calcium bromide at the anode bromine is produced electrode calcium b c d and e you get the gist so step number one that i always do is i find out whether the electrolyte is either molten or aqueous so if it's molten then there are only two ions in its electrolyte whereas if it's aqueous there's four the reason why aqueous electrolytes have uh, four ions is because you have the metal you have the negative non-metal you have h plus ions and you have oh minus ions so straight away you should be thinking about these things 
and also generally for BMAT questions, they uh, when it comes to aqueous uh, an aqueous electrolyte being used, the product at the positive electrode is going to be oxygen and the negative electrode, the cathode, is going to be hydrogen. It's not going to be the metal and it's not going to be the non-metal ion that's going to be produced there. So immediately using this rule, you can eliminate A and B. And in regards to the molten um, D and C, they're both molten, so they only have two ions in the electrolyte. So let's first look at E. Uh, the anode has chlorine, which is correct. And the cathode has hydrogen, which is incorrect. There is no hydrogen present in the electrolyte. So E is wrong. Now let's look at D. Molten aluminium at the anode. They're saying that aluminium is produced. That's incorrect. It will be produced at the cathode. And at the cathode, they're saying oxygen is produced, which is incorrect. Oxygen would be produced at the anode. So that leaves us with C. Just remember that, generally speaking, for aqueous electrolytes, they generally have oxygen and hydrogen at each electrode because they like tricking students. So that is my tip, and that's question number 14 completed. Question number 15. The diagram represents a satellite communication link between two points on Earth. The distances between the transmitting station, the satellite, and the receiving station are shown. The frequency of the waves used for the link can be taken as 1.5 times 10 to the power of 10 hertz and the speed of light as 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Below it, there's a diagram of this information. What type of wave is used in such a link and what is the time delay? What is the time delay between a signal being transmitted and then being received at the receiving station? So, immediately you should know that microwaves are used for this form of transmission, not ultraviolet, so we could eliminate E, F, G, H. Now, let's start looking at the time delay. So, we know what the distance is. It's two lots of 45,000, which is equal to 90,000. And we know the speed or at which it's traveling at, which is the speed of light. So, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So, we use the equation speed is equal to distance over time and rearrange it so that we get time is equal to distance over speed. So we do 90,000 over 3 times 10 to the power of 8. I'm not going to go through the whole thing of converting everything to standard form and then doing the division. I'm going to go straight to the answer, which is 0 0.3 seconds. So therefore, C, D, and A are incorrect, and the answer is D. That's question number 15 completed. Question number 16. The diagram shows a quadrilateral PQRS. There's a diagram of it below. Given that tan theta is equal to 4 thirds, what is the area of quadrilateral quadrilateral PQRS. So immediately I'm going to be splitting this this trapezium into two. I'm going to split it into a triangle. I'm going to be splitting it into a rectangle. And I know that this distance over here is equal to six because eleven minus five is equal to six. And now I'm going to look at tan theta is equal to 4 over 3. I'm going to use Sokotoa to, 
decipher this information. So, ka toa. So I'm going to use the toa part of Sokotoa, and it states that tan theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. So in this case, this line that I drew in is the opposite, and the adjacent is this six centimeters. So tan theta is equal to four over three, which is also equal to therefore something over six. And to get from three to six, we had to multiply by two. So therefore let's do the same at the numerator. So four times two is equal to eight. And therefore RS is equal to eight. And now let's calculate the area of this quadrilateral. So first I'm going to work out the area of the rectangle. Five times eight is equal to 40. Let's write that nicely. And the area of the triangle is going to be a half times six times eight. So a half times six times eight, which is equal to 24. 24 plus 40 is equal to 64. And therefore the answer is C. And that's question number 16 completed. Question number 17. Which of the following statements could describe the result of a single mutation of a gene coding for protease enzyme in a fertilized human egg cell? 1. A new allele is formed coding for protease enzyme that works more efficiently. 2. A new allele is formed coding for a protease enzyme that works less efficiently. 3. A new allele is formed coding for a non-functional protein that has no effect on the cell. 4. A new allele is formed coding for a non-functional protein that has a negative effect on the cell. So, statements 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all correct. The reason for this is because a mutation can do anything. It can make enzymes more efficient, it can make it less efficient depending on where the mutation is, and it can cause the enzyme to become a non-functional protein, which has no effect on the cell, or it could have a negative effect of the cell. So therefore, the answer to this question is G. That's question number 17 completed. Question number 18. What volume of a 0.1 molar solution of NaOH is needed to neutralize 30 centimeters cubed of 0.2 aqueous solution of diproctic acid? Step number one, work out the moles of the diproctic acid. So 30 centimeter cubed over 1000 makes it into decimeter cubed times by 0.2 is equal to 6 times 10 to the minus 3, which is equal to the moles. And why I'm able to do that is because moles is equal to volume times by concentration. That's step number one completed. Step number two, work out the ratio of NaOH that reacts with a diproctic acid. So for every one diproctic acid, two NaOH reacts with it. This is because two hydrogen ions are released when diproctic acid ionizes in water. And so using this information about the ratio, let's work out the number of moles that is needed for any OH. So 6 times 10 to the th minus 3 times by 2 is equal to 1.2 times 10 minus 2. Now we need to work out the volume of 0.1 molar NaOH that is needed. So using this equation before, moles is equal to volume times concentration. Let's rearrange that so volume is the subject. V is equal to M over C where M stands for moles and C is in concentration. 
and v is in decimeters cubed. So, moles is 1.2 times 10 minus 2 over the concentration was 0 0.1 is equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 1. And that is equal to 120 centimeters cubed. That's question number 18 completed. Question number 19. A defibrillator provides an electric shock to a heart to restore its normal rhythm. The energy to do this is 125 joules at a steady voltage of 500 volts for a time of 10 milliseconds. What is the current during this process? You should be thinking about the equations that you should have memorized for this exam. You should have memorized a very common physics equation in relation to power, where power is equal to current times by voltage, P equals IV. And you now must be thinking, we don't know what power is, we know what energy is. Actually, you're incorrect. We do know what the power is, because power is energy per second, and we know what the energy is in this uh, defibrillator and the time it takes. So. Let's first calculate what power is. So P is equal to 125 over 0 0.01, which is equal to 12,500. So we now have power, and we know what the voltage is, and we need to work out what the current is. So let's rearrange P equals IV to I is equal to P over V, which is equal to 12,500 over 500, which is equal to 25 amps. Therefore, the answer is D. That is question number 19 completed. Question number 20. Rearrange the formula A over B is equal to C over D plus E over F to make F the subject. So this is a question where you can't do any deductions. It's just straight maths. It's rearranging, simplifying. Let's get down to nitty gritty. So A over B is equal to C over D plus E over F. Now let's bring CD onto the other side. So A over B minus D is equal to E over F. Now let's multiply both sides by F. F open brackets a over b minus c over d is equal to e. Now let's divide both sides by open brackets a over b minus c over d. That's going to give us f is equal to e over a plus b minus c over d. Remember, everything that I'm doing is occurring on both sides. If I'm dividing both sides by, let's say, a over b minus c over d, it's occurring on both sides. Now, we've got a rough equ equation, a rough formula for f as the subject. Now it's just a case of simplifying. So that is equivalent to E D E over A B D over B minus 
C B D over D which is equal to B D E over A D minus B C. That is the answer. And therefore, C is the correct answer to the question. And that is question number 20 completed. Question number 21. Which statements describe a role of mitosis? Statement number one, asexual reproduction. Statement number two, growth of a cell. Statement number three, repair of cells. Statement number four, stem cell division. So statement number one is correct. This is because due to uh, two daughter cells are produced and they're both identical. They both have the same number of chromosomes. So that is correct. Now moving on to statement number two. Growth of a cell. This is... This is different from mitosis. Mitosis is cell division, not growth of a cell. So therefore, statement number two is incorrect. Statement number three, repair of cells. Mitosis has nothing to do with that, so statement number three is incorrect. Statement number four, stem cell division. Stem cells can divide through mitosis, so statement number four is correct. And therefore, A is the correct answer, and that's question number 21 completed. Question number 22. Calcium carbonate reacts with hydrochloric acid. The reaction gives off carbon dioxide gas. Line X on the graph shows the volume of CO2 formed against time when 100 centimeters cubed of one molar of hydrochloric acid reacts with calcium carbonate at 20 degrees Celsius. There was an excess of calcium carbonate chips. There's an equation for that reaction. Which line best represents the volume of carbon dioxide formed against time when the reaction is repeated with 50 centimeters cubed of 2 molar hydrochloric acid with, an, with excess calcium carbonate chips at 20 degrees Celsius. So here's the graph. There's line X and there's our options for the answer. So we're told that line X occurs at 20 degrees. So does the second reaction. And we're told that line X shows the volume of CO2 formed against time when 100 centimeters cubed of one molar hydrochloric acid reacts with calcium carbonate, whereas the second reaction uses 50 centimeter cubed of two mol uh, molar hydrochloric acid. So I want to work out the moles of the hy uh, hydrochloric acid in line X and in the second reaction that we're comparing it to. So 0.1 times by 1 is 0.1 moles. The reason why is 0.1 moles of, C uh, of CO2 gas released, of um, hydrochloric acid I mean, is because 100 centimeters cubed is 0.1 decimeters cubed, and the concentration is 1. Moles is equal to concentration times volume. 1 times 0.1 is 0.1 molar moles. Now, now, now let's look at the second reaction that they want us to look at. So 50 centimeters cubed is 0 0.05 molar times by 2, well 0 0.05 decimeters cubed times by 2 molar is equal to 0 0.1 moles. Guess what? They both have the same amount of HCl, so therefore I can infer that the same amount of CO2 gas is released. So I can eliminate A, D, and E because the line of their graph has to plateau at the same point as X. Now I need to look at the 
concentration and how that affects the rate of reaction. The more concentrated the HCl is, the faster the reaction, so I could eliminate C. Therefore, the answer is B. And that is question number 22 completed. Question number 23. An object that has a weight of 15 newtons on Earth is taken to a planet where it has a weight of 3 newtons. The planet has no atmosphere. Which line in the table correctly shows the mass of the object on the planet and the kinetic energy it gains after falling from rest near the surface of the planet through a vertical distance of 10 meters? And take gravitational field strength G on Earth to be 10 newtons per kg. So immediately I'm going to work out the mass of this object. It has a weight of 15 divided by 10 to 1.5. So immediately we could eliminate C, B, and A. And the reason for this is because mass is equal to weight over gravitational field strength. So now that's out of the way. We're left with D, E, and F and calculating the kinetic energy after falling 10 meters on planet. And that's to be in joules. What we can do is work out what the work done is instead of working out what the gravitational potential energy is. What I mean by this is instead of using E is equal to mg delta h, we could use W is equal to force times distance. So that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. So 3 times 10 is equal to 30. That gives us an answer of E. D and F are eliminated. The answer is E. And that's question number 23 completed. Question number 24. Some blood is found at a crime scene. The police know it belongs to one criminal involved. A person's red blood cells can have a have type A antigens, type B antigens, both types or neither type. In a population, 45% of people have type A antigens but not type B antigens. 9% of people have type B antigens but not type A. 43% of people have neither type of antigen. 3% of people have both types of antigen. An antibody test shows that, that there are type B antigens present in the red blood cell at the crime scene. What is the probability that the criminal's red blood cells have both type A and type B antigens? So, immediately you should be highlighting this line. The criminal definitely has type B antigens. So from these percentages, you could look at the 9% and you could look at the 3%. So he is in, or she, not being sexist here, the criminal could be in this 9% and in the 3% population. So we now know what the size of our pool is going to be. It's going to be 12%. That is the percentage of people that uh, that the criminal will most likely be in. Now the question is asking us, what's the probability that the criminal's red blood cells have both type A and type B antigens? 9% Nine, 9 of people have type B antigens but not type A, so we can't have a fraction of 9 over 12. But 3% of people have both type types of antigen. So therefore we could have 3 over 12 as our probability which is equal to 1 quarter. And therefore the answer to our question is D and that is question number 24 completed. Question number 25. An experiment was carried out to investigate a gene for coat colour in mice. The diagram shows the results of three crosses between different mice producing three different families. P, Q, and R. 
What is the maximum possible number of heterozygous mice shown in the diagram? So straight away, we could determine that the dark coat allele is dominant and the white coat is recessive. Therefore, for a mouse to have a white coat, they must be homozygous for the white coat allele. Therefore, all four of the white coated mice shown must be homozygous for the white coat allele. However, to display the phenotype of the dark coat, the mouse only needs one, uh, one allele of that particular gene. Therefore, it's really unlikely, but all the dark mice could be, in theory, heterozygous. They are, at the end of the day, asking for the maximum possible number of heterozygous mice shown. It's not asking us for the most probable, it's asking us for the most likely. Well, not the most likely, it's asking us for the theoretical. So let's double check if there are 12 black mice, and there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Therefore, the answer is H. That's question number 25 completed. Question number 26. The gases X and Y react to each other to produce gas Z according to the equation 2X plus Y goes to 2Z. 100 centimeters cubed of X was mixed with 10 centimeters cubed of Y in a free moving gas syringe sealed with a rubber cap. The reaction went to completion. All volumes were measured at the same temperature and pressure. What is the final volume of gas in the syringe? So, for every two moles of X, it reacts with one Y to produce two Z molecules. So, with this information, we could work out the answer to the question. But first of all, we know that there will be a limiting factor to one of the reactants, X or Y, because they're not in the correct proportion. They're not in a 2 to 1 proportion in the syringe. So, clearly, Y is the limiting factor of this reaction. So when we calculate volumes of gases, we need to do it in relation to the proportion of Y that's available, not looking at the uh, volume of X. So let's do that. So for every 10 cent, let's say if all 10 centimeter cubed of Y reacts, therefore it reacts with 20 centimeter cubed of X, which is equal to 30, and it produces 20 centimeters cubed of Z. The difference of 30 and 20 is equal to 10 centimeters cubed. Now we know what the volume is going the total volume is going to decrease by in this gas syringe so originally we had a total of 110 and that decreased by 10 centimeters cubed and therefore the end volume the new volume is going to be 100 and therefore the correct answer is D. And that is question number 26 completed. Question number 27. Light travels through glass at a speed which is two thirds its speed through air. Light travels through water at a speed which is three quarters of its speed through air. A ray of light has a wavelength of 360 nanometers when traveling through water. What is the wavelength of this ray of light when traveling through glass? 
First, we need to consider the equation that we're going to be using for this question, and that will be velocity is equal to wavelength times frequency. Let's just sort out my wavelength symbol. There we go. And let's rearrange that so wavelength is the subject. Now, from this question, we know that the speed is slow in water and even slow in glass. Since it's two thirds slow in glass, we can see that to keep up with the free, keep the frequency the same, the wavelength has to decrease to two thirds of its wavelength in air. Mathematically, we need to first calculate the wavelength in air using the same logic as earlier. The wavelength in air must be greater than the wavelength in water by a factor of four thirds. So let's form an equation with this knowledge. 360 times four over three is equal to 480. Now, when the wave is traveling through glass, the speed is only two thirds of its speed in air. So the wavelength is only two thirds of what? Of the wave length in air. So let's apply this knowledge to this question. 480 times two over three is equal to three twenty, and therefore the answer to this question C that is question number twenty seven completed. Thank you very much for listening to this complete walkthrough. I hope you found it useful. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Also leave a comment if you want further clarification on any explanations that I've given during this walkthrough. And please leave a comment if you want to give video suggestions for the future. Thank you very much and hopefully you'll be watching another video of mine.